On this episode of China Unscripted, we take you behind the scenes and on the ground in Hong Kong. Police fire tear gas indiscriminately at pedestrians and reporters, and the Hong Kong government responds by cracking down harder. Hi, welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chapel. I'm Shelley Zhang, and I'm Matt Ganesha, and we are back from Hong Kong. So today we're going to do kind of a recap of uh, what we saw. Yeah, some of the behind-the-scenes stuff that we saw that we couldn't put in our episodes. Because it was too extreme for YouTube to handle. And all, all of right. the delightful tear gas we experienced. No, that's that's a memory I have. But first I'm going to pour us some, some tea. So, as you may know, China Unscripted is sponsored. Is that the right word? Sponsored? It seems like you're having trouble talking and pouring tea at the same time. I am having a hard time being jet lagged talking and pouring tea <laughs> at the same time. So we are sponsored by Path of Cha, a wonderful Brooklyn-based Chinese tea company. So tonight we are brewing a tea from them called Liu Bao Guangxi Hei Cha. So this is a, a black tea, but not a black tea as we know it. But what we in the West typically call black tea, in Chinese they call it red tea. This is a black tea, though. It's actually a very old tea. I'm kind of burning my hands on it. Um, it's sort of a precursor to what uh, we call poor tea. Uh, this is actually a very ancient tea. Uh, they used to, uh, I know, we should have mugs instead of glassware. Matt was burning his fingers. Uh, so in the old days, tea trade was pretty important to China, especially for a lot of the nomadic people uh, further out from the center of China. So what they would do is they would do this sort of wet fermentation process of like these bricks of tea. And uh, that's essentially what this tea is. It's a very old way of brewing tea. So I can smell it from here. Yeah, this is going to be strong. This is what uh, this isn't the tea the emperors would drink. This is what your Mongolian herdsmen would have. Mm. Now it's so hot. Because of uh, preservation <laughs> reasons? or Yeah, the wet fermentation process was so it could uh, yeah, be preserved for the long haul from the more southern tea-producing provinces. Tastes like poor. What makes this not poor? Well, uh, I wouldn't be able to specifically say the difference, uh -huh. but I know this is, was essentially like a precursor to poor. Got it. Tea. Um, and poor tea is sort of divided into raw poor and the more modern cooked poor tea. Well, so what do you guys think of the tea? Those Mongolian herdsmen had good taste. They raped so many people, Matt. And good taste in tea is all. <laughs> Maybe we cut that part out. <laughs> people need to know. Never forget, Shelley. Uh, uh, well... What do you think of the tea? It's, I mean, I immediately feel more awake. It's, it's nice. It's, you know, it's got that distinctive, pretty strong, it's a pretty strong tea. Yeah. yeah. And boy, do we need it. The jet lag. Uh, what amazed me most about this trip, I mean, we were, we were in Hong Kong a couple of months ago, but like the, the things have changed so much in Hong Kong, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a tenser situation than it was when we left back in early July. We left before, um, you know, it had gotten quite so bad. We left before the triad white shirt people had attacked uh, protesters. We left before there was, um, you know, police had entered the subways and started, you know, tear gassing the subway stations and pepper spraying people on the trains uh so there there's been a lot of escalation yeah yeah even in the protesters themselves i remember uh we were there when uh protesters back in june first uh barricaded the hong kong police station and they they like used paper to cover up the security cameras so like they couldn't the protesters weren't filmed and then, like, later in that week, they did it again. But this time, like, it really escalated, and they used spray paint on the security cameras. 
And like at the time, it was like, oh, wow, that's a huge escalation to like, you know, actually damage public property. And then in like these protests, you know, there's they're doing graffiti everywhere. Yeah, the uh, graffiti definitely has definitely escalated. increased a lot in Hong Kong. But I would say it's still less graffiti than your average European city. Like I was in Venice recently and like especially on the outskirts, there's like a lot of gra- graffiti uh, on like the 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 mainland part of Venice, uh, you know, when you come in on the train, or when we were uh, when I was in Milan, or you know these places where you're like, oh, you know, Italian cities must be beautiful, graffiti everywhere, or Paris. If you remember when we were in Paris, like how much graffiti there was just getting in, yeah, to Paris. So, yeah. but also the difference is the Hong Kong graffiti is all like free Hong Kong, or you know resist or like these different things that are all political statements uh not just people tagging so a lot of it's a little bit more clever more stenciled or they have like stencils on the um pedestrian crosswalks the stencils are new they've they've really like yeah graffiti has evolved uh to stenciling now um but uh yeah actually uh getting a little ahead of ourselves but uh, I saw a photo today of somebody who had graffitied like an advertisement on the side of like a bus shelter that was like a a woman, like for like a beauty product, and they had graffitied a mask on her, and like uh, graffitied the words "Arrest me, baby," huh. <laughs> because uh, of the anti-mask law that we'll bring up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess we'll try and deal with this chronologically. Yeah. Uh, One thing I did notice that uh, was not in the previous protests, or it's the same protest, just 100 days in, I guess. But uh, they've started uh, protests that started defacing uh, pro-Beijing companies. So, for instance, uh, the Starbucks franchise in Hong Kong is owned by um, a company called Maxim's. So, yeah, Maxim's is... A large conglomerate company in Hong Kong, and they own a bunch of different, among like food stuff, food companies, including Starbucks. So people have been graffitiing up. Well, because the owner of Maxims, like, well, it wasn't the owner; it's the heiress to the Maxims fortune. Oh, um, I say heiress, but she's. An older woman. She looks like she's in her sixties or something. I'm not. You can, you can yeah. be an older woman and be an heiress. Yeah. Shall so I? she, um, went to the UN and um, basically criticized the Hong Kong protesters, called them rioters and things like that. Yeah. So uh, that's why Starbucks has been getting a lot of grief, as, as opposed to just Chinese owned. Or, like, state-backed companies in some way. Like, there's different levels of mm-hmm. kind of retribution that the protesters are Yeah, but you'll see those stores, like, getting graffitied, or sometimes their windows smashed in. Um, I believe there's also, like, an apartment or a hotel that uh, had, like, a, during one, like, particularly violent clash between uh, police and protesters where police were firing tear gas this like hotel like said oh protesters come in here for shelter and then when they did uh the hotel like called the police on them yeah it was during national day so protesters oh. have said that they the the night of national day where police were kind of on the streets doing tear gassing a lot of people so they said that protesters said that they will you know revenge themselves on that hotel but i haven't heard any sp- specifically yeah. what they they're doing to it so yeah. i mean there's been a, that's one of the controversial things people talking about whether protesters should even do that well you, you know? told me today that there was a, a vote going on amongst the protesters about uh, about that yeah because uh especially this past weekend there was a lot of escalation because of the anti-mask law uh so you know there was more property destruction than usual and there were also some instances of um you know like vigilante justice kind of where uh (laughs) you know somebody would come and attack the protesters i saw this guy wielding two axes at the protesters but then the protesters hustle yeah then the it was an old guy too oh geez (laughs) uh and like the protesters would fight back and like 
you know, attack him with sticks, you know, or there was a taxi driver who it seemed like he got into like a verbal altercation with some protesters, then suddenly drove into a crowd of protesters, ran a couple people over, like a one girl had both her legs broken, mm -hmm. and then the crowd surrounded the taxi, pulled the driver out and beat him up. So, you know, people were talking about like, is this going too far? Like people don't trust the police to treat um, the these situations fairly so sometimes Naturally. they're like we have to take justice into our own hands and then there was a lot of conversation you know this week about whether you know we, and they're like we don't want to be perceived as like the red guards or something like that like we don't want to take the violence too far mm -hmm. you know and then but mm -hmm. like there's also talk about like whether you know we still don't want to like divide the protest like we don't want to like pit protesters against each other we have to support everybody but how do we dial down the violence in a in a leaderless movement yeah. so there were there were talks about this on internet forums and on telegram and they there was a poll one of the telegram polls where people kind of vote on like what to do and i think almost 80 percent of people voted to stop the uh kind of like defacing um like pro beijing businesses mm -hmm. uh for the time being you know. I mean, I got to say, like, if, if there's somebody wielding axes or driving their car into you, I feel like the natural reaction is to beat that person up. Yeah, but I think the problem is that, like, when you've got a taxi driver versus, like, a crowd of, like, hundreds of people, it becomes, like, it becomes hard to control that, you know, like, between punching a guy a couple times and, like, almost killing, you know, like, there, there could be, like, a... Like well, I mean, that's a natural thing. Like if, like if somebody ran you over, I would be dragging that pro that driver out and beating them within an inch of their life. Well, and that's the natural human reaction that well, should be you, embraced and loved. And then you, but then you could argue, like, well, you know, police are just defending themselves when they shoot protesters. You know what I mean? So, like, mm. so that's a, I think a, a, a slippery <laughs> slope argument to make. Uh, also, there's the issue of. Um, often these videos get out and it's very easy to like for like the pro CCP people to kind of cut off the first few seconds of the video where it shows the the guy initially attacking the protesters and mm -hmm. just show the part of the video where like you know here are 10 protesters beating on some poor old guy they don't show the part where he's like charging at them with axes, you know, yeah. like that. Kind or of that thing. the there are other protesters that break up the fight. But um, I mean, yeah, this is like a, a criticism that I've, I've been seeing more and more of, like people being like, "Oh, you know, they're they're getting too violent," and you know, like especially after being there at this time, like it's easy to like level criticisms like from the comfort of your own home, especially in like a free and democratic society. But, I mean, you know, if you're in a city on the brink of totalitarianism and you've already gotten, like, two million people out on the street protesting and, like, the government still is doing nothing, like, what do you do? Well, I think the government's never going to let there be, like, a two, two million person protest again. They're obviously trying to suppress protests by shutting down MTR stations so people can't get there. They're, the police are not, um, you know... They're not giving permission for protests the way that they used to, mm -hmm. even for the groups that have these hugely peaceful protests. And they're, ne you know, the protests themselves don't get like the marches themselves don't get violent. Uh, so they're obviously like trying to shut down peaceful protest as a way of like kind of expressing things to the government. But that was basically the only way the Hong Kong people could express things to the government. So now it's just become these like clashes with police. I mean. There was a good, um, uh, like, the, the thing is that if you are, are just catching, like, maybe an occasional New York Times article or South China Morning Post article about the protests, especially South China Morning Post and their coverage, I, I mean, a lot of their under uh, on-the-ground reporters are doing great coverage, but, like, in the paper, because it's now owned by Alibaba, mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese company... Um, where Jack Ma, the CEO, is like a member of the Communist Party, you know, yada, yada, yada. Like, their 
coverage is very skewed, like in the paper that's printed or like the emphasis that they give it uh, in their stories online is like all about the protester violence. Mm-hmm. So it'll be like protesters set fires or like, you know, vi- without the, you know, without the context. Like I didn't really understand the barricade fires until we went there. Mm-hmm. And then we saw them like set fires like in front of uh, MTR stations, this is a subway system, because the police were using the MTR stations to, like, as kind of like they would sit in the MTR stations and then come out of the stations and fire tear gas, like, at protesters, like, out. So, like, protesters would set fires, small rubbish fires in front of the stations to try to stop them from coming out and then to get the fire department there. So that the fire department could come t- put out the fire, and it would delay the police from going after the protesters. I think part of the problem also is that uh, it's natural for media to, you know, including us, to cover conflict, mm-hmm. and so you tend to have somewhat of a reporting bias in favor of the most extreme things, like the action things, right? Yeah, a- and like I totally get why that is, but what's sometimes missed in the coverage is the the broader context of how it's not like protesters are suddenly violent it's it's that uh protesters feel like over the course of the of these 100 plus days and over the course of of uh more than two decades of chinese rule they have exhausted every means to try to maintain hong kong's freedoms uh you know they they basically tried dialogue. Um, they tried, you know, peaceful protests during the Umbrella Movement. They tried, tried peaceful protesting on June 9th. They and tried June 16th. getting involved in the political situation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And like at every turn, they were basically denied this opportunity. They tried to have their own legislators. Uh, le- the legislators and the legislators were disqualified. Dis- dis- yeah. So uh, thank you for finishing all my sandwiches. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I guess if you if you understand from this larger context of people trying every and all means to preserve the liberty in their city and being completely denied at every turn, and, then yeah. you understand that they feel now like they really don't have any choice but to try something else, right? It, it's kind of like uh, my wrestling coach used to say uh when when i was losing badly in a match he'd be like do something do anything oh i thought you were gonna say he would say pull out a gun no no no. that's how i won my wrestling matches (laughs) that's the police um yeah and and so like yeah i I get where these protesters are coming from And, and even that being said the ones who are setting fires throwing molotov cocktails uh and so on are still actually a pretty small Minority. It is a pretty small minority, but I do have to say that people are not, people are not as upset about that as they would have been even five years ago. You know, I think if during the umbrella protests, like people have been like setting fires and throwing uh, like petrol bombs at the police, like people would have been outraged. Mm-hmm. Now everybody's kind of like, well, that. It's not good, but really it's the government's yeah. fault. I mean, the city is on edge, and, I, and I, I, I think you articulated very well, Matt, what I was trying to say earlier. And, like, to those listening, I would, I, I would say, like, really think about it. Like, if you were in their situation and your, your freedoms were on the line and the government was not listening to you, what would you do? What would you do in the situation in place of the Hong Kong protesters? It's, it's a challenging question, like, being there. Like, I, I felt myself getting pretty riled up like I, I don't know how i would deal with it well i think also the thing is that a lot of people can kind of armchair like quarterback this thing where they're like yeah. well if the protesters were a little calmer and maybe they need to negotiate like the Hong Kong government has shown over and over again that there's no negotiation there's like no ru- and the way that they've reacted to the peaceful protest versus the uh, more like hardline protests are it's exactly what the this graffiti that they put on like the protesters uh did inside the legislative council when they broke in on july 1st that said you're the ones who to- taught me that peaceful protests don't work and yeah. and it's totally the situation yeah that being said we were at five protests 
over the course of the week we were in Hong Kong. Uh, and, you know, some of them were completely peaceful. Uh, and even the ones where there was pepper spray and tear gas uh, was not like, uh, it wasn't like the majority of protesters were going after the police. It was more like the police were taking a very extreme measure to deal with protesters. Like the first time that, that we got tear gassed was on uh, okay. Sunday, September 29th. The anti-totalitarianism march. Yeah, right. I mean, although like, I think this is kind of the pattern where like when there's a peaceful protest, it will start out peaceful and it'll be fine. Then the police will come, and then it kind of devolves into like street battles between like the frontline protesters and the police. Well, well, I mean, if you go by what happened on um, the totalitarian, anti-totalitarianism March Day, which it was a little different than what happened on National Day a few days later, but so that day for us it began. We were basically in kind of a shopping district, and there was a bunch of police. That was an unusual circumstance though because like people were saying that that was the first time that had ever happened before oh. yeah well so what happened was it was basically loads of police in a shopping center loads of press filming them and then just bystanders going about their day shopping and shouting at the police like what the hell are you doing well it's because there was like a good hour hour and a half before the protest was going to start riot police were already there and this is like in the middle of Times Square or in the middle of uh, like it's an area called Causeway Bay. So it's like the biggest shopping center area of Hong Kong Island. So people were, you know, there were no protesters there, really. Yeah. yeah. And then the uh, police just started firing tear gas. Well, before that, they were just, there was a big group of riot police. And then they started like yelling to like disperse, you know, like for the crowd to disperse. And like they were antagonizing the crowd, which was mostly bystanders. It was not yeah. protesters. And again, a busy shopping district. So not quite like New York's Times Square, but it would be like if if there's police there saying, crowds, please disperse. No one no one be here in Times Square. And then like people were like, I was like, where are they? What? Who do they want to disperse? Like it was just like a and then the more they kind of did this the more anti because this is the thing this is one of the things that i definitely realized this trip to hong kong people hate the police now oh yeah like really really hate the police like anytime you have riot police on the street uh and then like the like people will start to like gather and just like curse them out yeah. like i think by the end of this podcast we'll have painted a picture of why that is yeah but like so people are people are you know yelling at the police but nobody is physically attacking the police nobody's really you know they're just at some point it looks like the police like may have arrested a person so like a big crowd gathers and they're yelling at the police to let somebody go but like you can't say that they're you know in any way threatening the police yeah oh but what i was going to say about the the marches like after that initial clash where well, it's not even a clash it's where police just start firing tear gas at press and bystanders uh eventually the march actually began and there was tens of thousands maybe a hundred thousand people marching and it was technically an illegal gathering since there was no permission but you know this these were the street was full of people marching and i think we all felt like totally safe in all that yeah i mean like hong kong protests do we want to go back to the the tear gassing first before we talk about the march or well i'll just make this mm -hmm. point and so like, it was totally safe, and, like, we thought the day was, like, kind of wrapping up, and so we go up onto an air bridge to kind of get, like, a long shot of, like, you know, these thousands and thousands of people marching, and then suddenly a bunch of people start running in the opposite direction, and then, nope, there's the riot police shooting tear gas at all these people. Yeah, and the, the riot police were shooting tear gas from a sky bridge, which is to say that the police weren't really defending themselves exactly. They kind of had this... this unfair vantage point from which they could shoot at people and i think you're also not supposed to use shoot tear gas like that because it's you're very not supposed dangerous. to shoot tear gas from above right because the canisters can can hit people like yeah. you know on the head and stuff but also they're not supposed to use that much tear gas in general like it was a lot of tear gas that wasn't even i don't i don't actually know what the number how many canisters they shot that day it, it was wasn't as much it wasn't as many well, let's, national let's hold day. That. 
This but is a suspense. You'll never guess how many tear gas cans they shot on National Day. Stay tuned to find out. Yeah, so, but like, to go back to what was very weird about this particular protest on Sunday, the, the anti-totalitarianism march, was that police fired tear gas before the march even started. So this was when we were still there. We were there with the press and, like, bystanders. And then, like, suddenly the police, I think even the police that were around us weren't really expecting it because none of them were wearing gas masks. Oh. Uh, but, like, suddenly, like, Matt, maybe you had the clearest vantage of this. I, I did because I put my uh, mask on just in case, and Chris had his mask on, and Chris was filming a stand-up for the episode. And then I saw in the background of the shot while Chris was speaking that the police were were shooting pepper spray at reporters. And I was like, Chris, watch out for pepper spray. And then, like, Chris gets out of the way. And then I dodge a policeman going after some guy with an umbrella. And then I turn to my left and suddenly I'm engulfed in white. And it's just this I'm in a fog of tear gas. And thank goodness I already had my mask on. Uh, and I just could feel the gas like everywhere uh, on my exposed skin. Because I was wearing shorts because I didn't think it'd be like so intense. So it was just like my my face was protected. But, oh, man, there was so much tear gas. I couldn't believe. What how does it suddenly, do to your skin? Uh, it, it burns. It doesn't burn as much as pepper spray. Like, pepper spray is more of an acute burn. Because you got pepper sprayed the night before, and we've been actually skipping over that. Yeah, well... Do we want to go back to that? I I don't, but, like, to to say, you know, tear gas versus pepper spray, you know, on the skin, I think pepper spray is worse. But uh, if you're not wearing a mask, probably tear gas is worse. I mean, I was not wearing a mask when they started shooting tear gas. Oh, Shelly, we all wear a mask. Uh Uh-huh. I was yeah. not wearing the kind of mask that would protect and it, me and from tear gas. it's not great, is it? Well, I didn't breathe in. Like, one, a canister landed, like, almost at my feet. And then instinct took over, and I, like, ran off in the opposite direction and managed to get my mask on. But that by then, it was like what you said, like, clouds of white, like, tear gas yeah. all yeah. over the street. It, it came so suddenly. And it... I, like, didn't have my helmet on, so it was burning all around my face. Uh, and then, like, I had pants on, not shorts or anything, but, like, it got up my sleeves, and then, like, m- it burned my armpits, and I was not expecting that huh. feeling at all. And it was just, like, yeah, it, it's not a pleasant thing yeah. to have that all over your body. I know one policeman, like, shot his tear gas gun, like, right next to my ear. Yeah. Which I don't think you should, like, it was in a big crowd of people. I don't think you should be shooting it like that. I got footage of that one. I think it was, because he'd shot and it was like two feet above my camera no. where the canister went. And I was, I didn't quite realize at the time just how almost at me he was shooting. Yeah, that's but, so dangerous. But also, like, he was shooting it at reporters. Like, it was just reporters there. There weren't protesters in in that shot. I mean, there uh, was a crowd a little further away of the bystanders, which cleared out really quickly because none of them had masks or anything. Like, these were not people who were prepared to face tear gas. Mm -hmm. They were prepared to do some shopping on Sunday afternoon. Yeah, well, (laughs) not anymore. But, like, it was just stunning how, like, you know, we have, like, these, like, pictures of the street, this huge street that's completely clear, just, like, rolling clouds of tear gas uh, and, but like for no re- before the march even started, so that was that was the first that we got to. Uh, like, apparently, oh, yes, things have changed. Yeah, the, well, I mean, not just a first for us, but it was a first for the protest. Apparently, police have not done that before, where they yeah. start off with tear gas. And again, like they were, they were unprovoked because there weren't protesters there. Well, I mean, you could <laughs> you could argue that people were yelling at them. There, you know, there was a certain amount of antagonism. Look, it's it's in the a crowd. natural reaction when people yell at me. I just fire tear gas at them. Uh, yeah, and then you get all your buddies to fire tear gas too. So. Right. I mean, that's just a natural. You start shoving reaction. everyone around. Yeah, I mean, like we, like, and then the police kind of went off, and we started following the police, like all the press. We are like, I feel like we spent most of our time like chasing the riot police mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, uh, and then I, but like. I saw some guys like there was this guy with a camera who did not have a mask on 
He just had a towel around his neck, like a like a hand towel around his neck. His Jeez. face was completely red. His eyes were streaming tears, and he's still taking photos. Man. <laughs> like there's some people who are, you know, yeah. like no, we, we got the right masks because we had uh, gotten some advice from uh, from some reporters we knew who had been in Hong Kong, and they're like, uh, she she wrote to me like, get this mask. It's like a full face with. Like a, it's like, like a, goggle and mask. And, and it's mask like a combined, respirator yeah. that covers your entire face. And, and when uh, and when she when she sent that to me as like to buy in preparation for the trip, I was I was thinking, are you serious? Like this seems really extreme. But it turned out that it was actually. The, I feel you know, there are pros and cons to that mask. Like a definite pro is the fact that it covers most of your face and like, with really good visibility. Yes, with good visibility, and there's a lot a lot less like exposed skin. But because it's so big, you can't really wear it around your neck, you know, or like on top of your head if you've got a helmet too. So it's like always a like a process. Like it's hard to get it on. Get it on. Yeah. So then you end up having to wear it a lot. You know, when there's right. no tear gas around because you're not sure if there's going to be imminent. I mean, imagine tear gas. being one of those World War I soldiers in a trench where, like, the gas masks are huge and, like, mustard gas could come. And if you get a little bit of that, you're dead. Yeah, I mm-hmm. can't. I mean, like, I mean, although, did you see the kind of gas masks the police were wearing? Those they were, were hard. They, they for... looked more like the World War One masks. Yeah, they were, yeah. they were gas masks. They weren't just like the respirators that like yeah. people use for a, a paint or whatever that yeah. we had. Yeah, no, those police look really scary with the masks on. Yeah. And especially when they're carrying their tear gas. And then shooting like shotguns. They look like uh, shotguns, right? The tear gas yeah. guns. Yeah. yeah, having one of those aimed at you, which like I think all of us oh, all yeah. did at, at through, one time. Through the course of that, that whole trip, I've, I've just so many weapons pointed at me it was so weird but it's also like i was thinking back to this because um the first protest we went to was like an, a rally saturday night that was like commemorating five years since the umbrella mm-hmm. protest started which was like september 28th 2014 and then like i was thinking about what art intense experience was during the umbrella protest do you remember that where we were like that oh, night in mong kong oh, Mon- yeah yeah the night in mong kong we were like oh this is intense like the the triad police have come out and they have shields you know like right. they oh weren't God. and, and there, i remember like there was a point where i could sort of like feel the pepper spray in the air and i was like oh that's pretty serious someone pepper sprayed yeah, we missed all the tear gas because they really only used tear gas on on the 28th, which is the thing that right. made everybody so upset. The whole 79 days of the Umbrella Movement, they only the police only used 87 cans of tear gas. Yeah, and it was mostly on that first day, I think. And after that, they did use pepper spray a lot, I think, especially in Mong Kok, where there were kind of some rougher crowds. And and I remember that night seemed like really aggra- like aggressive yeah. and really like we seems were like, cute now. Yeah, I mean, now I'm thinking about like the police were never geared up to the point that they are now. Like we never saw people no. in riot gear. And I think since Matt brought up the 87 cans of tear gas used in the entire 79 days of the Umbrella Movement, I think we gotta give an answer to that question of how many cans of tear gas they used on National. Well, Day. first tell people what you guessed. When I asked you. Uh, okay, so knowing that a record was like 87 for Umbrella in the entire 79 days, and then one day I think they used, in this series of protests, they had used like 100 in one day. The, okay, the the previous record was 800 in one day. There was like a... Oh, jeez. On the August 31st, I think it was, like there was like a pretty uh, like, uh, like intense day, and they had like used 800 some canisters oh, i think i must have missed that yeah. i think i guess like 500 yeah you guess like 500 and matt said like 200 or 300 something like that the answer is 1400 canisters of in tear a gas. day and that is an official estimate by the police that's insane uh yeah i mean previous to that they had fired uh in the previous hundred days of the protest they had fired two thousand some Mm-hmm. So they almost doubled their I mean, number. Right, but in but one it day. makes sense because you know uh, Hong Kong canceled the fireworks to celebrate China's National Day, and so the police were just being patriotic. They wanted to celebrate, but they didn't have fireworks. They just had loads and loads of tear gas, and so they just fired bullets. those uh, into the air and at 
people. Yeah, it looked like Hong Kong looked like some apocalyptic zombie hellscape then. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, well, like, like to... I remember running we, down we were really the freeway getting a, with ahead you, Chris. Of sel- yeah. Ourselves. So. Okay, all right. So before yeah. we d- delve into the National Day horror show, um, oh yeah, uh, since, since we were talking about the mask on uh, the totalitarian march, like you know, we had these pretty decent respirators. But, like, at the end of the day, I was I just felt, like, horrible. And I was like, man, am I just, like, a wuss? Matt and Shelly don't seem Did you feel bad. it burning when you were breathing? I, I didn't feel it burning when I was breathing. Uh-huh. So I, I couldn't figure out what was happening. But, yeah, I was, like, coughing at the end of the night. I, I just felt awful and super tired. Yeah, I definitely assumed it was because you were a wuss. Yeah, well, <laughs> turns out, Mr. Matt... Uh, thanks to uh, many viewers mentioning it, apparently a beard interferes with the seal of the respirator, uh, so tear gas must have been kind of seeping in, which is why in World War One they made all the soldiers shave their beards, because that, before that, guys had beards. Um, so, yeah, then I had, to, I had to shave my beard so I wouldn't be tear gassed. I mean, some people were suggesting innovative things to do with, like, Vaseline or something, you know, but that sounded like finicky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was much easier to just shave and not have my lungs damaged by tear gas. Um, but that was sad. I it's mean, still tear growing gas, back. Tear gas does linger. I when yeah. after the police fired that first round of tear gas uh on uh, Sunday during the anti-totalitarianism march, like people started slowly coming back onto the street. Like, okay, so they fired the tear gas. Then, then they went off into these police vans and just drove off. And Heroes like, of the day. Yeah, it's like, they're done now. They've cleared the Don't streets. Don't worry, people of Hong Kong. Yeah. You are safe now. Uh, and then slowly, slowly people started to come back. And this one older guy asked me, um, first in Cantonese, and then I had to say the one Cantonese phrase that I said the most during our entire stay, which was, I don't understand Cantonese. Um, and then he asked in English, he was like, was there tear gas here? And I was like, yeah, like 10 minutes. Because he was like, oh, yeah, I can still smell it. Yeah, it really stays yeah. there for a while. And even blocks away from where it's shot. Like, it'll be, like, in the air. Yeah, I mean, and you will start coughing. Like, yeah. it's not pleasant. Which is why it's not really pleasant to shoot tear gas in a shopping center. Or a... Subway. subway or a subway you know or, or really really anywhere that people are but i do think that the, the the mtr has better ventilation than the new york subway system that's definitely true but yeah it's uh yeah, i mean the mtr is a very nice subway system except for the tear gas i mean people have joked and it's kind of true that even with the tear gas it's nicer than the new york subway system by a long shot yeah that's kind of true someone was saying that what like it's hard to explain um, to Americans or people who like don't have like, live in a, a place with the efficiency of like the Hong Kong's MTR state, like w- like how big a deal it is when they shut down MTR stations or when the police like use them, like, and people are so mad that they like vandalize like the 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 turnstiles or whatever. Like, I'm someone said that like one year they had a less than 99.5% efficiency rate, so everybody got two days of subway rides for free. <laughs> oh, my wow. gosh. You mean they didn't, uh, the MTR wasn't like, oh, well, we need to double the ticket fare so we can <laughs> so we can deal with this. Well, most of New York is just like, the following subway stops are not operational all weekend. Yeah. And that's like the normal routine. Or didn't they like shut down the like L like a year or two well no i mean they've modified it yeah. because people were so upset about that so it's it's just running every 20 minutes on the weekends now instead of being uh-huh. completely shut off but yeah it was just like every time we we're in the hong kong subway it's like a train will come every two minutes yeah yeah it's really nice so uh, but <laughs> yeah it was really nice until the the police started using it as their <laughs> underground lair yeah Basically, it's very sad what's happened to the MTR in a lot of ways, because in the beginning, they were actually helping the protesters ish, not necessarily because they supported the protesters, but like as a public safety issue, they would run extra trains to get people like out of the areas Mm -hmm. where like clashes were happening with police or 
the protests were happening. And then um, state run Chinese state run media started publishing articles criticizing the MTR for helping the protesters, basically. So then the the MTR, which is partially owned by the Hong Kong government, um, came under political pressure to stop, you know, to provide worse service. Yeah, to to stop being safe for people, really. Yeah, and it's 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 absurd. Like, wh- what do you do if your city is erupting in mass protests about government ineptitude? Why we should shut down the subway system so people can't get to the protests? That's obviously the logical reaction. Yeah, and you really saw uh, the sort of strategy with the subways used on uh, National Day, which uh, was the day October first that uh, celebrates the communist takeover of china the people's republic of china's 70th birthday basically basically 70 years um so in beijing there was like a huge military parade and celebration which carrie lam went to because you know there's there's not much happening in her city right now um but uh protesters in hong kong had uh had their own way to celebrate 70 years of the people's republic of china they shut down a few major MTR stations early in the morning, and by the by the afternoon they had shut down like a lot of the different MTR lines. Much right, because them. the government well, was they, hoping that by shutting down MTR stations, they could stop people from protesting. Well, because the government is stupid. Well, actually, I was afraid that they would be stop, able to stop a lot of people from protesting because there was supposed to be a big march happening from the same place we got tear gassed on Sunday to the, like, central business district of Hong Kong. And most people don't live on Hong Kong Island. Like, they live on the peninsula. So if if you stop the subway lines, you know, you will stop a lot of the protesters. Yeah. And so there were smaller protests in the other parts of the city, but uh, there still managed to be a huge turnout for National Yeah, Day. I was pr- I mean, like... There are easily tens of thousands of people. I think the organizers say it was over 100,000. Yeah. And uh, and one thing you saw in, in this protest march um, that we, we also started seeing uh, earlier in our trip this time that we hadn't seen in the first part is that uh, protesters were specifically calling out the Chinese Communist Party and I mean, not just the Hong Kong government. Yeah, it makes sense for National Day, but also in the anti-totalitarianism march on Sunday, which was very much about how the CCP is totalitarian. and Yeah, they were using uh, Chi Nazis. And um, the world this needs to, the idea that the world needs to stand up to the CCP because Hong Kong is just the beginning. If Hong Kong falls, then, you know, it's not going to be good for the rest of the world. Well, it does kind of give you a sense of how much the Chinese Communist Party values its uh, agreements with other countries. Yeah, you know, one country, two systems is totally still valid. <laughs> right. I mean, also, the Communist Party uh, initially had something like one country, two systems with Tibet, which was the, called the 17-point agreement. That was in the 50s. And they violated that within, like, 10 years. And they basically just took over Tibet. Oh, well, well, I mean, it's taken them a little longer with Hong Kong. Yeah, but I think there's a lot more media attention on on Hong Kong, you know, in 2019 than there was in, like, the 1950s in, like, a remote Himalayan area. Yeah. Well, actually, they tried to. They already tried to screw up Hong Kong in two thousand three. Oh, that's true. That Article was that was pretty. The anti subversion law. Article twenty three. Yeah. Into it. Yeah. Well, we don't really have time to go into we, the whole. We, we don't. But like at, at any rate, the the CCP basically they has, tried to change the constitution right. of Hong Kong. I, I saw like a, some protester art in Hong Kong, and it was the Grim Reaper walking by these doors, and the first door was Tibet. Oh, that's and a, the, yeah. The that's second a door was Xinjiang. The third door was Hong Kong, and the fourth door, which hadn't been opened yet, was the world. I'm pretty sure that's a meme that I've seen. Okay. Yeah, like, well, it's, it's, a, it's a meme, a meme. that yeah. has been uh, changed to reflect the situation. Yeah, I've seen like a lot of <laughs> a lot of different ones with different things involving Hong Kong, and the and then they started putting the Chi Nazi logo on the Grim Reaper. Okay. Yeah. So it's funny because there's these like swastikas everywhere. A lot of them made up of the the yellow stars on a red background, but in the shape of a swastika. So it looks like the Chinese flag. Though it was funny, like on they initially it was like the Chi Nazi flag, 
and then I guess at some point people protesters were like, oh wait, people might think we might we're supporting Chi Nazis, and so then they start adding anti Chi Nazi. Or like just actually just to what be they clear, started we don't add. like this. Yeah. On the flags, there was like a big X, like a big black X over. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, like so. I, I understand that they wanted clarity. I don't, I don't think it was super necessary, but yeah. Well, I mean, in this day and age, everybody gets accused of being Nazis. Yeah, so. Well, especially when everyone's carrying a Pepe doll. Oh yeah, and we skip talking about the Pepe's Way protest, but you should definitely watch our video about that our China Uncensored episode about that. Yeah. It was actually one of the sweetest Hong Kong protests. I've because been to, it wasn't I think. interrupted by tear gas. Well, yeah. You know, we've been in, what, a, five or six of these, like, big Hong Kong yes, protests, protests tests yeah. now, and, like, they all have, a like, a common, you know, thing that happens where, like, different groups give out posters for people to hold with, like, slogans mm. on them, and everybody's watching, walking down the street with their umbrellas and their signs, and, like... And no one's ever looting any place or burning vehicles, it's, so it's not like a riot. No, I mean, this is, like, this is the traditional Hong Kong peaceful protest, which is, like, it's, like, a tradition, and, like, everybody knows, like, everybody's gonna hand out the signs, people are gonna take the signs, people are gonna walk, march, you know, with your friends down the street, uh... And it just felt kind of like that. Like, there was just a huge crowd of people moving down. Um, like, we went up to this, like, overpass to shoot shoot the footage of the crowd. I mean, and I was impressed because I was like, wow, a lot of people came out, despite the fact that... You the, couldn't even get to the city. Yeah, like, the government was trying to... to On the MTR. To completely stop this kind of thing from happening on today, which was would be very embarrassing uh, for the Chinese government, you know. So it was impressive to see... So many people, and the it, like, the high of the crowd. People just like, um, you know, we met. Uh, well, I think the most um, interesting guy we met was the the person from San Diego. Oh yeah, we met a fan of the show who lives in San Diego, but to support the protest, every two weeks he flies out to support the protest in Hong Kong. Yeah, he flies out from San Diego to Hong Kong. He's not from hong kong um he's a, like a american white guy and he said that he was just really moved by people who are trying to fight for their freedom mm-hmm. um, he does work with an airline though so that's why he can afford it but uh, um, and then he said that he felt like you know him coming out here really was very helpful to his you know spreading awareness back in San Diego yeah, about what's happening in Hong Kong. And that's one thing Hong Kong protesters really appreciate when they find out that people outside of Hong Kong really are paying attention. So anyone listening, like, something you can do is to just, like, give messages of support, tell your friends and family, tweet, use Facebook to talk about what's happening in Hong Kong because that's, it's, it's really a big help. Definitely. And this is kind of the feeling of... This, like, oh, you know, like, the feeling that, like, everybody's marching, you know, against, uh, you know, totalitarianism and this kind of big group activities happening. Uh, and it's kind of fun, right? And then everybody gets to the end of the march in Central, and it starts to kind of disperse. And we're interviewing... Is it Lee Chuck Yen? He's like a, a, like a when, pro-democracy former legislator. Yeah, he's like one of the pan-democrats. So th- there are some people who kind of took a risk to come out and publicly lead this march because they'll probably get arrested for it later since the police didn't give um, the police didn't give permission for it. So it was an illegal march. So we were in the middle of interviewing this guy on camera, and then we hear bang, bang. Bang! It's the tear gas sound. Yeah. And so, which we now know very well. And so we mm-hmm. like quickly but politely end the interview and then run towards to see what's happening. And you know, I just wanted to make sure that you know cameras rolling the whole time, trying to trying to get you know footage and document now all this. Uh, the uh, eventually we got to uh, these hordes of Hong Kong police. I'm talking hundreds of riot police they weren't firing tear gas at that moment though uh no but they they were basically marching down the main road which is harcourt road which is like a freeway 
that cuts through central Hong Kong. And they are basically just decided to clear out everyone, even though there weren't really a lot of people left to clear out from there, but they just like marched through with their with their um, rubber bullet guns and their tear gas guns. Well, what happened was we had actually, like, as we were following the riot police here, like, the protesters were being confronted by other riot police in Admiralty. So we kind of missed the action at that point because we were following the main group of riot police. But, yeah, there were still protesters there, and they were, it was starting, like, there's footage of, like, the police just firing rounds of tear gas onto protesters with umbrellas trying to like ward it off, you know? Yeah. So, uh, we ended up, we kind of got separated, Shelly, you from me and Chris, but, but Chris and I were, uh, like running alongside these riot police. Meanwhile, you had started to do a live broadcast, uh, and, uh, the police were just like running down, the road well they run and they take a break because they're probably not in very good shape uh and then well i remember one part mm -hmm. where like like this one like policeman like walked up to all the press that was there and had like this shoe box and he opened it up and it was like there was a funnel and uh, like an alcohol bottle there and he like set it down very proudly i was like hey come film this huh checkmate maltov cocktail as if like that justified everything. And it was it was ridiculous. It was like a little funnel and a single bottle. And he was like, yeah, how about that? Yeah. So, you know, the police basically just... Um, Didn't you guys get caught in some tear gas at this point? Yeah, well... So we, what happened we, was there was like several deployments of uh, riot police that were all marching towards uh, Central and kind of converging into becoming just one giant mass... And then just suddenly, man, and I found ourselves on this street that was like, this was like zombie apocalypse. There was, there was fires. It, everything was like thick with tear smoke. Uh, riot police were everywhere. There were like some protesters like kind of like on the ground being arrested. Yeah. And, they and they were, were just shoving. They were shoving the reporters the with their shields and stuff. Yeah, it was because uh, we were, you know, trying to get as close as we could to get footage. Yeah, they, they always now shove you aside whenever right. they're arresting people. They don't want any of that yeah. being like well, captured. Yeah, yeah, no. So they they have no compunction about shoving reporters, uh, firing tear gas when there's only reporters. Yeah, well, uh, one Indonesian reporter got shot in the eye. Um, well, wow, yeah, like I think that was on the totalitarian. Oh, yeah, news on it was March on Day. Sunday. She got shot with a rubber hit with a rubber bullet. And that's something else. You're not supposed to aim at the head, but they've done that. And so now this reporter is going to be permanently blind in that eye. So that was a fun thing to think about while we're running from legions of police. Yeah. So I mean, I just our skin is burning. I mean, I think also you, the police are hyper aggressive now. Yeah. Versus the last time we were here. I mean, even like on July 1st, like there were police who were trying to have like a jokey conversation with you, you know? Uh huh. Yeah. yeah like, even uh, what's his face? But uh, like now, like anytime you, you like riot police see reporters, their immediate um, first thing is being aggressive. Like when we accidentally came across those police on National Day who were harassing that Falun Gong practitioner lady. And oh, like yeah. their first thing was to like, come at us like like and be like you can't film this you can't yeah. film this you know well this, yeah. since Shelly brought up what happened that's in that part we were on a sky bridge and like suddenly like five riot police descended on this little old lady fallen gone practitioner who she was, like totally out, she was like handing out flyers or something she was kind gone. of like a little she like, didn't know what was happening yeah and, uh, yeah, and so then we start filming, and then they notice we're filming them, and then they, like, start shoving us out of the way, saying, oh, it's very dangerous. We have to get you out of here for your safety. And oh, I'm like, like, oh, yeah, she seems very dangerous. <laughs> I mean, it was like a police – they had basically cleared – were clearing the sky bridge, so they are like, oh, anytime they say it's a police cordon, then they have a reason to, to justify shoving you away, but – yeah. Right. Well, it seems like the entire city of Hong Kong now is a police cordon. It, so. it definitely felt that way that that day in Wan Chai, like when you guys were getting caught in the. Yeah, I had never seen anything like that, and it definitely makes that night in Mong Kok look very quaint. The no. one from five years ago. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was just 
fascinating. Meanwhile, the the most the biggest action icon on the live stream was right in the beginning when the police started running. There's a police officer who tripped over himself and fell flat on his face. And I got it on video. Unfortunately, the quality of the live stream wasn't very good oh, at bad. that point. But like people definitely noticed it because everybody was like, did that guy fall? But like, they're, they're not all the most uh, physically astute. Yeah. Well, I think also that, that there's so many riot police now. They have had to lower their standards. Uh, and so you have... You know, some people are like, you know, these elite group called the Raptors, but there's also a lot of people in the regular riot police uniforms who are just ordinary cops. They might be beat cops. They might even be people who are and they're now the equivalent all of like meter police. maids. Oh, yeah. Matt, they're all beat cops now. Oh. <laughs> well, I just remember the day watching, uh, this was Sunday, watching the police fire tear gas off the roof of the police building uh-huh. onto this group of protesters that were on a sky bridge. They were just waving like the flags of the world. You know, they're not like violent protesters or anything running away from the tear gas. And like, there's a giant banner on the front of the police headquarters. That's for recruitment. And it was just like f- fairness, like justice, like these like, professionalism. Join the Hong Kong police. <laughs> yeah, as the police are firing the tear gas down. It was just like, oh, mm. God. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, for, from one perspective, I do kind of understand how the police feel. And I think it's important to understand how they feel, which is that uh, they are uh, they're being required by their government uh, or by their commanding officers, at least, to, uh, you know, be aggressive they're uh, really overworked because they're they keep getting assigned to these protests where they don't need to be at they're working long hours uh they're constantly frustrated uh and they're kind of caught between everybody hates them everybody hates them right and so like if you're this like you know 24 year old you know guy without maybe a college education and you join the police force and like suddenly you're now asked to be a, a riot police officer you have basically uh very little training you haven't been trained in like how to you know do community relations and they stuff definitely haven't been trained how, how to de-escalate right these like like situations because it seems like everything they do is just escalating it more they're not there to calm right. people down but, or and so they, they, they make they make no attempts yeah. to do this and i think a lot of them they don't they don't have the proper training and they're out of shape and they're just like thrust into the situation and so so this this doesn't justify at all what the police are doing but i think you know i'm trying to understand where they're coming from and i think this is partly why the police are so aggressive and then the more aggressive the police get the more aggressive the protesters get which makes the police more frustrated and then even more aggressive and i think it's actually been studied that like when you when police are more geared up like the more kind of like armor they're wearing like the kind of like it makes people more aggressive too right. and, and when they're wearing this, masks as well yeah i mean they've i noticed like the police are way more masked up even when they're not wearing like the gas mask for the tear gas like they have these masks that cover the it's lower it's hard to half. identify who yeah. they are yeah. they and, have these masks across the lower half of their face that look kind of like the the jason masks or like the like the the uh like Hannibal Lecter. Yeah, have Hannibal Lecter cuz like there's like a like a, a grill. cage grill mm-hmm. thing but like they have these like scary masks on and then it's it's yeah it, it definitely increases that increases the aggression I mean, yeah well. they, they feel like they're the victims which is i do have to say like later that night on national day in one chai like when the police were marching down and we were following them like people just That's started absurd. gathering and Again, cursing them out. Well, because what was happening was it was this farce where these row after row after row of riot police would march down the street firing tear gas, and the streets were empty. It was just press. Yeah, I mean, we saw them at one point at the end of the night, like, put up the black, you know, warning tear gas banners, when there was just like a row of empty garbage bins that the protesters had left behind and everybody was just like, what are you going to fire at? Yeah. You know, uh, but even when, when they weren't firing the tear gas, they were kind of just on the road, like waiting. And the protesters were kind of like backing away. Like they're, they're very far away from each other. People started gathering on the sides and just watching. And then 
harassing the police, basically. Yeah, the police are very much hated. Yeah. So, and then at the end of that, and the end of that night, we just kind of, like, after we saw them threaten to tear gas a bunch of empty garbage bins, they suddenly turned around. Like the, they had these big water cannon trucks with them. And suddenly, like, the water cannon truck starts to do this, like, three-point turn and leave. Very awkward. It was more like an eight-point turn. Yeah. And then as it became apparent that the police were leaving, suddenly all the bystanders start yelling at them again, where they're like, I heard some of them say, like, shinkula, which is like, you know, oh, you worked hard. You know what I mean? Like, really mockingly at the police. So it was just... It was just kind of, and we felt it was just like a ridiculous. Yeah. Like, and they were starting to wave cars through, and like the people in the cars look like either absolutely panicked because they have no idea where to go, or they're crying because this like is what's happening to their city. You know, you're like trying to figure out how to drive through hundreds of riot police and yeah. not get. Yeah, it was just a, it was just a bad, but also, like, it was a, it was a terrible situation, but just like you said it was a farce like yeah. and so this goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the podcast like if you are someone in hong kong dealing with this kind of a police force and this kind of government that doesn't listen to you and you've exhausted every tactic you can think of what do you do i mean i think also a lot of what's happening is that now that the police have declared these things illegal assemblies um they're just trying to arrest as many people as they can mm-hmm. Um, they're trying to get people off the streets. Uh, even before National Day, they were trying to, because they can hold people for 48 hours. So then they can try to keep people from going to the next protest. So, uh, you know, police aren't using tear gas to disperse people. Uh, they're not dispersing the crowd. They're trying to trap the crowd into like a small space so that they can just arrest as many people as they can. Yeah, they'll get people, they'll get the protesters in pincer attacks. Yeah, and so like when we were in one child like watching these police and then like the protesters were trying to like back, like they were trying to retreat was what was happening, but the police were just trying to like catch them. Yeah. So. That was also the day that uh, there, there was the first incidence of police actually shooting with a live round shooting a protester. Yeah, point that blank actually, in the chest. That happened in um, the other part of Hong Kong that we were not in. Um, and those, those protests, like police started shooting off tear gas much earlier because there were let fewer people. And uh, there was that incident where it looked like there was a group of maybe like I don't know, seven or eight young guys um, getting into one of those, like, stick attacks with the police where, like, the police had their batons and the guys had these, like, PVC pipes and they were, like, hitting each other. And uh, a police officer draws his weapon and walks towards the protesters and then ends up shooting um, this 18-year-old high school student in the chest. Yeah. The student survives though yes he um was in critical condition but he was then stabilized um it missed his heart i think by centimeters like three centimeters so and and even since we've left there's been another 14 year old kid who was shot so these things uh, he was shot, escalating. yeah that mm-hmm. guy was shot by like an undercover cop maybe who seemed or not undercover but a plainclothes cop who had his gun on him who yeah so that was like a, a weird situation. Yeah. But I think we'll wrap it up with uh, this podcast up with just sort of how we left the city where Carrie Lam and the Hong Kong government basically implemented these emergency powers uh, that uh, are allowing them to ban protesters from wearing masks. It might mean there's going to be a curfew put into effect. Um, and so really you see the, the government escalating things to a level where they're just trying to make it impossible for people to legally protest. And it was amazing because the justification for the anti-mask law was that this was going to make Hong Kong safe again. You know, this was going to, people want to be able to go shopping and whatever, and this was going to do it. And uh, even the the rumors before they officially announced it, the rumors of this anti-mask law brought tens of thousands of people out on the streets during the lunch hour which we witnessed. So it was obviously uh, not a de-escalation tactic, but 
just added more fuel to the fire. It's just mind-boggling how all of these Hong Kong government decisions, which I would say uh, either directly or indirectly have the Chinese Communist Party behind them, uh, have served to just make things worse at every step. Like, you know, the... You know, the, the subway system is, is helping move people around the city safely. Oh, well, the solution to stop protesters is to just make the transportation worse for everybody. Or the solution to protest is to just ban them from wearing masks as if that'll stop people, which it did not. It's like the, the, the Communist Party does not understand how to deal with Hong Kong. Well, yeah, there's a, there's a cartoon of uh, Carrie Lam setting fire to Hong Kong with the anti-extradition bill and then she like brings a bigger gallon of gas and like like f- like you know called police brutality and pours it on the flame of Hong Kong and then she brings a bigger gallon that's like the anti-mass law and pours it over and then there's like a bunch of gallons or a bunch of large canisters of gas that are like curfew uh you know limiting internet like all these other laws that they've talked about they might that's the new thing where some government official was like well it might be justified to you know cut off the internet or you know limit the internet so that the protesters can't I'm communicate be surprised if they start censoring the press yeah so there i mean that's all possible with these emergency regulations ordinance like that they can unilaterally make these laws and it'll take time to get them like to try to challenge them so who knows yeah. so again that's why hong kong protesters need international support i mean that's really the the attention the international attention is very important to them and and the support also of the hong kong people which i know all of us have thought at various points that like this is you know the protesters you know, the people are going to get tired of this, right? Like, they're, they're going to yeah. get tired of... Or the, the mainstream Hong Kong society will turn against the protesters. But luckily for the protesters, any time that they do something that mainstream society could criticize, the police just do something even worse. Like shooting a 14-year-old kid. Yeah, so it's just like... Uh, there have been multiple surveys done where people kind of are like, we disapprove of the violence, but we blame the government. You know, yeah. and, then and the increasingly police. blaming the Chinese Communist Party as a yeah. whole. Well, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if that's mainstream across all society, but certainly among a lot of the protesters, they're seeing that, you know what, like it's it's the the CCP or the the Chi Nazis, as they might call them, are really the ones that are kind of behind all this. Yeah, I mean, I think you can see the support for the protesters is not ending. The night we were in. Wan Chai on National Day, a lot of the protesters disappeared because they were people opened their their apartments to them and sheltered them inside the apartments to get them away from the police. You know, like that's it was it's just like a people are still, you know, on the side of the protesters and against what the Hong Kong government has done. And it's the the destruction, especially of the trust in the Hong Kong police force is humongous and i don't know how they're going to repair that i mean at this point the people are calling for a complete disbanding of the hong kong police force and really i don't see any other satisfactory way that could be resolved well maybe they maybe with a curfew or maybe <laughs> by cutting off the internet oh yeah, maybe there's there's yeah. yeah i think so yeah the, the, that's that's the good idea i mean it is even when we were here in 2014 people were proud of the police force they were like the hong kong police even the protesters would say things like you know the hong kong police are the best police in asia like it's yeah, yeah not anymore nope no. nope now they're just like they all hate the police i think there was some guy who threw a bag of dog food at the feet of a police officer <laughs> during like some standoff in like a residential area cuz the, they call the police dogs so and I, I kept seeing all this like graffiti and it was like F the Popo. Yeah. I'm surprised Popo has been has been taken up over there. Yeah, apparently, you know, and also there's a lot of like graffiti referencing dogs. I even saw a communist dog graffiti, which was like a new one for me, you know, combining the Chi Nazi idea with the dog idea. So mm-hmm. they're getting more inventive. Well, so even though we're out of Hong Kong, we're still going to be covering it a lot on China Uncensored. Uh, we're also you know, going to 
be posting about it on the Chine Censored, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Shelly, you tweet a lot on your Twitter. My Twitter is at S-H-E-L-Z-H-A-N-G. Yeah. Shelly has all the tweets. She does. And remember, for all you listening, international support is what this is going to take. So, so you know, talk about this with your friends and family. Do your own social media posting. Write to your representatives. T- tell them that Hong Kong matters to you and that you want to hear it brought up. Uh, specifically in the U.S., the... Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act is going through Congress right now. Yeah, so definitely write to your representatives about that. That would uh, basically allow the U.S. government to, uh, every couple of months, re-examine whether Hong Kong was still really a free society, and if not, uh, the U.S. would end a special trade status that treats Hong Kong as something separate from the rest of China. So that's a powerful economic uh, tool the U.S. can leverage to kind of put pressure on the Hong Kong government and the Chinese Communist Party. It's amazing. At this rate that they're going, the first review is going to be like, no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, yeah, something that uh, both Republicans and Democrats can be united on. It's amazing. All right. Well, thanks for listening to this episode of China Unscripted. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. We'll talk to you next time. Mm-hmm.